Well, hi, everyone. Thanks to everyone who's just joining us now. Um, welcome to our third ETAC Empowerment and Accountability web series presented by the International Coalition to End Transplant Abuse in China. My name is Erica and I'll be your host for today. Uh, to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we meet today and pay our respects to the elders past and present. ETAC's Empowerment and Accountability series has been designed to support advocates from the victim communities and their supporters. We also welcome people from outside those communities to attend and engage with the issue of forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience in, conscience in China. In addition to the monthly webinars, we are also forming two research groups, one for Arabic speakers and one for Mandarin speakers, and an advocacy group. If you would like to assist, please let us know by replying via the follow-up email we will send after the webinar. Today, Ethan Gutman will provide an overview of the evidence of forced organ harvesting from Uyghurs. Ethan Gutman is a co-founder of ETAC and a research fellow at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation in Washington, DC. He is the author of The Slaughter and co-author of the 2016 update on forced organ harvesting in China. Ethan was also nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Thank you, Ethan. The floor is yours. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? That's key. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah, this uh, confidential memo that you're going to see, um, that's point one there. Uh, this was written for a carefully selected group of Uyghur activists, Falun Gong researchers, uh, Western policymakers, and, and, and there are probably some reporters slipped in too. Uh, it's a snapshot of what we know and what we don't know uh, about state-run organ harvesting in Xinjiang, East Turkestan. Uh, well, our understanding of Beijing state-sponsored organ harvesting of Falun Gong and to a lesser extent Tibetans and House Christians has grown over the last 20 years. The CCP has continued to use Xinjiang, East Turkestan as a secret laboratory, a total suppression of Uyghur, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, uh, Uzbek, and Huey voices. Uh, just a trickle of Uyghur witnesses coming out from the camps uh, to the West, and major television networks reduced to taping scripted events at CCP-selected camps. Now, in 2019, this memo could have only raised a series of provocative questions. Yet 2020 was the year that we made contact, uh, where several pieces of critical evidence came together. Thanks to highly dedicated individuals operating around the world, uh, Gulchura Hoja at Radio Free Asia, Sir Jeffrey Nice in the London China Tribunal, now the Uyghur Tribunal, uh, Uyghur and Kazakh activist groups, too many to name, and several independent researchers, some who can't be named at all, a comprehensive picture of Uyghur organ harvesting is now coming into focus. And I'll start with point one. And I'm going to do something I don't like to do, which is read aloud what you're going to see on the screen. But uh, uh, this language in this memo is somewhat precise. So I'm, I'm going to follow that uh, discipline for, this, for the course of this talk. Point one, live organ harvesting of political and religious prisoners began with the Uyghurs. Uh, slide. 1994, local PSB units on Xinjiang execution, execution grounds began shooting, not to kill, but to send the prisoner's body into shock. Doctors were ordered to remove the liver and kidneys as the victim died. Slide. This is uh, Nijat. Uh, he was a Uyghur member, a Uyghur guardsman in a PSB unit that specialized in Uyghur terrorists and activists and so forth. And uh, he, I believe, probably participated in some executions. But the key thing is that in 1994, he heard screams coming from the medical vans where they remove the organs that are parked on the execution grounds. And uh, what kind of screams? He said, as if someone were in hell. Okay, screams coming from hell. But slide. Uh, this is a year later. Uh, this is Enver Totti, a friend to many of you in the audience, I'm sure. Uh, Enver Totti actually was forced as a surgeon to take out the kidneys and liver of a living human being who had been shot and then shot in a non-lethal way. The man could have lived conceivably. Uh, uh, slide. Slide, please. 
1997, uh, in the wake of the Gulja incident, Uyghur medical staff were quarantined while the PSB purged Uyghurs from the police force, executed local Uyghur activists, wrapped and sealed their bodies, and patrolled the cemeteries to prevent family members from examining the corpses. Slide. Slide, please. Yep, this is a Batyar. He was a witness to many of these events and he's on the record. Uh, there are, uh, there's a nurse who can't be on the record because she has family in uh, uh, East Turkestan. And, uh, but she specifically was aware that they were killing Uyghur, uh, second born Uyghur children in the hospital at the same time. It's a pretty strong charge, but I, I, I do believe her. Uh, slide, please. In 1998, Chinese Communist Party cadres began flying into Urumqi to receive transplanted organs extracted from Uyghur political prisoners. Slide, please. Uh, now, I don't have a picture of the main witness on that. I call him Mirat. However, this book is available, which has uh, goes into uh, his testimony in, in, in some detail. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's available on Amazon, and I've heard it makes a very nice Christmas present. Okay, slide, please. China's number two point, China's transplant industry becomes a hungry beast. Uh, slide, please. From 2000 to 2016, with an estimated 450,000 to 1 million Falun Gong in detention at any given time, the Chinese transplant industry quickly surpassed the transplant volume of all the other countries in the world. By 2012, China was transplanting over 60,000 organs per year some to foreign organ tourists. Slide, please. In mo uh, this is, by the way, where a lot of these uh, Falun Gong were coming from. Uh, this is uh, Shenyang Prison City. Uh, slide, please. And a lot of them were going here. We don't know how many, but this is Tianjin Central Hospital. It's probably the largest transplant hospital in the world. It does about 5,000 transplants per year, or it certainly did at times, and sometimes more. Uh, this was a, it made this hospital particularly interesting is that it caters to foreign organ tourists. Slide, please. Uh, here you can see an ad that they had on the web uh, all the way into 2014, late 2014. It used to be my favorite party trick was to ask people to call this up on their, on their phones. Slide, please. Now, in most countries, the wait time for an organ is about two years. In China, with a stable of Falun Gong tissue types ready to be harvested, the wait time became two weeks. Killing on demand reached its peak in certain hospitals which specialized in emergency liver transplants with a wait time of four hours. Slide, please. Uh, now, one of the things at this point, you can say that when Falun Gong came online as an organ source, the execution, the, the balance of execution shifted from such scenes like this. Slide, please. To scenes like this, that is the, these became the new uh, executioners of China. Slide, please. Now, all Falun Gong in detention after 2001 were subject to organ scanning and blood tests for tissue typing or cross matching uh, with potential organ recipients. Now, from 2001 to 2016, the author, that's me, estimates between 125,000 to 250,000 Falun Gong were harvested. Slide, please. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can sort of see the method I used, which was uh, what I call field research method or field survey method. Uh, these are, for example, uh, some women in, uh, Falun Gong women in uh, uh, Bangkok. And uh, all of these women, they leave the guy in the middle out of, out of but uh, all these women were uh, in labor camp. All of them were tortured. One of them, I'm not saying who, was sexually abused. And uh, the woman on the left, Jing Chan, was given uh, a series of organ tests. And for some reason, they decided not to harvest her. Okay, next slide, please. New victim groups were exploited for their organs, housed Christians in 2002, Tibetans in 2003. Slide, please. 
uh, the these are two who got away uh, Tibetans and are, are still alive today. Slide, please. Now, then you have a movement of a go west. In Shanghai, a hospital is built into a prison in about 2008, approximately. In Xinjiang, East Turkestan, there were sporadic reports of young Uyghur men and even a 12-year-old girl subject to organ scanning and blood tests. Slide, please. This is that 12-year-old girl today. She's in the middle. Uh, that's Rahima Mahmoud, who was translating on this particular interview in Istanbul. Slide, please. Uh, in 2013 to 2014, police forces in several provinces entered Falun Gong homes to take blood samples and DNA cheek swabs. This is a combined method of cross-matching an organ for potential transplant that is touted as being highly accurate. Slide, please. Now, one possible interpretation is that China's transplant industry had grown so relentlessly and the CCP had so aggressively carried out the attrition of Falun Gong that demand for organs was beginning to outstrip the number of Falun Gong in detention, or at least Falun Gong of the right age in detention. Uh, slide, please. Uh, point three, Beijing forces 10 million Uyghurs, approximately, to give blood samples compatible with tissue matching. Slide, please. In 2016, provincial health authorities enforced mandatory health checks on all Uyghurs, examining over 13 million people. Ultimately, the tests would incorporate Kazakh, Kyrgyz, and possibly Huey. Slide, please. And to do this, they had to use uh, some new methods. They were very creative. This is a, a mobile a rail hospital or a rail clinic, hospital clinic, which was used for this purpose. Next slide, please. Uh, here's another mobile one. I believe this is uh, either built into a, some sort of RV. Uh, slide, please. Now, Han Chinese, nearly half the population of Xinjiang, East Turkestan, were exempt from the test, thus ruling out the possibility that Beijing was concerned about infectious disease. Slide, please. And that goes for surveillance, too, and uh, checkpoints and all the rest of it. As you see in this picture, these are people lining up just to go into a market. Uh, they're all, uh, they're the ones who are examined, and they're all Uyghurs uh, or Kazakhs or Kyrgyz or Hui. Uh, slide, please. Now, none, this is very key. None of the Uyghurs or Kazakhs that I spoke to reported receiving medical tests or follow-ups from the health checks. In short, the tests were not aimed at improving individual health. Slide, please. And a very vivid example of that is Tursa and I, the, this woman here, that's her husband as well, and who I interviewed in Kazakhstan, and, and she had a collapse, or her heart uh, uh, had some serious problems while we were doing the interview. It was a rather alarming situation. Uh, those troubles began in camp. There was nothing done about these troubles in uh, camp, and then they pursue her to this very day. Slide, please. Now, according to the Uyghurs and Kazakhs, the one universal features of the test was not a DNA test, uh, as reported by Human Rights Watch, but a large blood test compatible with cross-matching for organ transplantation. So that sort of rules out theories by several human rights organizations that the health checks were given solely for surveillance or anti-terrorism purposes. Slide, please. Uh, a blood test can also be exploited as a DNA sample. So in essence, approximately 10 million Uyghurs received the same combined cross-matching test used on select Falun Gong three years previously. Slide, please. Point four, the net closes, the camps are constructed, and the testing begins. I should say the real testing. Uh, slide, please. Beginning in 2015, CCP authorities ordered construction of camps across the Xinjiang East Turkestan region and a mass surveillance structure using both human checkpoints and electronic readers that could determine both race and stress levels became standard across the region. Slide, please. Uh, yeah, so this is an example. This is a, a surveillance equipment that's made in China being sold in Kazakhstan. Uh, and uh, I've spoken to one of the software engineers who worked on this project, and indeed it can 
detect if somebody is Uyghur or Chinese. It's 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 a learning. It, it uses uh, evolutionary algorithms and learns over time. Uh, it can also detect stress. I think that's very key because that came out today that Huawei is actually uh, was involved in this project, but it didn't talk very much about the stress. It was the combination of two: the fact that a person was showing some stress on their face, something you or I couldn't perceive, but a machine can, and the fact that they're Uyghur, uh, which would lead to their arrest on the street. Slide, please. The the claim that by the end of the of 2016 that at least one million have been arrested, tricked into entering, otherwise detained in the camps was initially met with Western media skepticism. Now the scale was validated by local PSB chapters bragging about the percentage of males in their prefectures they had incarcerated, then by witness accounts, and finally by camp construction activity uh, captured by satellite imagery over time. Slide, please. Okay, so here's an example of one of those. It's just one of many uh, images like this. Here's a camp, and this is one year has elapsed, and you can see it's it's mushroomed into this uh, massive uh, this uh, massive holiday camp. Now, uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, all prisoners were given a comprehensive health check entering the camps, including blood tests. EKGs and scans of their lungs and other retail organs. Now, these tests became a regular occurrence approximately every two months. Slide, please. And in the case of uh, this woman, who was actually identified by the uh, Uyghur, the London China Tribunal, uh, you know, she described after the tests, they would often, people would have to wear color coded uh, outfits of some sort, like a vest or, or a or some sort of mark on them. Uh, and these tended to indicate that these people were going to be taken away and, and, and harvested. Uh, slide, please. Point five, the crematoriums follow. Uh, slide, please. From 2016 to 2018, Uyghur and Kazakh witnesses described several mass executions of male camp prisoners. We don't know the reason for the killings, which overloaded local disposal systems such as normal crematoriums. Slide, please. Now, for obvious reasons, we don't have pictures of that sort of thing. And uh, we do have pictures of this sort of thing. Now, most of people in the audience have probably seen this image. Uh, it's from a video. You can see that they're transporting uh, Uyghur males, we presume Uyghur males, from one location to another. Sometimes these things would go bad, and we don't know why. That is, they would meet the end of Xinjiang, and they would go into Qinghai, and suddenly everybody uh, would be taken out of the trucks and so forth, and, be, and were shot. At least that is the story that has come down to us, and it's come down in a number of different ways from a number of different sources that this has happened repeatedly. Uh, we really don't have enough evidence to go further on that, but let me move how to, I think this, intersects with the crematorium construction. Slide, please. Now, local crematoriums also acknowledged occasionally burning bodies from the camps, while Uyghur cemeteries were routinely bulldozed. Uh, slide, please. This is an example of a Uyghur cemetery, which has just been bulldozed. Now, the what's interesting about that is they are undoubtedly collecting DNA. I've, I've never said they are not. But this is an attempt to destroy DNA at the same time. Okay, so you are wiping out people's family histories while you are at the same time taking DNA. Thank you. That's, next slide is good. Uh, next slide is fine. Yeah, that's fine. As early as 2017, local authorities put out a directive to construct nine new crematoriums across Xinjiang, East Turkestan. Slide, please. Uh, now, that finding uh, came from Gulchera Hoja at Radio Free Asia, who I am proud to uh, name as an associate and as a, a colleague and a friend. Uh, and I believe this is one of the most important findings we've, we've ever received. Uh, and let me tell you why. Uh, next slide, please. When, you know, when we were looking at the Wuhan, the deaths to corona, uh, coronavirus or Wuhan virus or COVID-19 in Wuhan, one of the things that people started doing was counting funeral urns. These are funeral urns. And we discovered that it was about uh, 45,000 or something like that uh, people had died. In other words, it was about 10 times what the 
official death toll will say. Uh, so these kinds of measurements, specifically things surrounding the death industry, are very, very important and often can even tell you something about the way things are going. So if we could have even looked at how those orders uh, transpired, we'd get some sense of how the, uh, the movement of, of COVID-19 in Wuhan. Uh, slide, please. Now, to give a sense of scale in this case, the first crematorium that we know of, because it was being completed at that time, was located in Urumqi. And there was an ad in the Chinese press to fill 50 security guard positions, 50. Now, the incentive was a salary of 1,200 US dollars per month, which is a, a small fortune in that region of the, the world. Slide, please. Uh, next, the, this is point six, the appearance of the Green Passage, airport fast lanes for human organ transport. Slide, please. The first Green Passage lanes were initiated in Eastern China in 2016 by China's most prolific heart surgeon, Dr. Chen Jingyu of Wuxi People's Hospital, and it was supported by China Southern Airlines. Slide, please. Now here they're looking very happy together. The, 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 the doctor, Dr. Chen is on the left and, and uh, the representative from China Southern Airlines is on the right. But they'd actually had a big conflict because Dr. Chen had lost some organs when he couldn't get aboard a flight in time. Uh, I don't know whose fault it was or whatever, but he couldn't get aboard that flight and those, those organs became unusable. And he was able to put a lot of political pressure on China Southern Airlines. They started opening up these green lanes, these special fast lanes. Uh, and China Southern Airlines has since then made a big deal about bragging about that and how important it is. Slide, please. So Dr. Chen is a very powerful man, okay? And we're gonna come back to him a little later in the presentation because he's a somewhat pivotal figure here. Uh, you could say he's not so much uh, the, you know, the king of heart transplants really here. He is the king of uh, the logistics of organ harvesting. Slide, please. Well, the, well, the Xinjiang East Turkestan crematoriums were being constructed. The first green passages appeared in the Kajgar and Urumqi airports. There was initial incredulity surrounding the land's existence uh, because the population using these airports are, by Chinese standards, ridiculously small. I mean, there's, a, there's no, almost no need for a fast line. The channels were openly labeled special passengers, human organ exportation lane, i.e. outgoing only, not incoming. Slide, please. And here's an example of one. I, th I believe this one is in Kashgar. Uh, slide, please. And I believe this one's in Urumqi, though there's also one in Qinghai, so I may be confusing them. But I will say one other thing. You know, these actually got photographed by uh, Japanese tourists, and they put them up on social media. So uh, they're not Photoshop jobs. These are the same images uh, all over the web. Uh, slide, please. Uh, the green passages were built as part of the solution to a specific problem. The hospitals of Xinjiang, East Turkestan were traditionally not considered to be an attractive destination for wealthy foreign organ tourists. That is people who pay 10 times as much for their organs compared to a Chinese person. Uh, slide, please. Uh, the second problem was that human organs traditionally have a short period of transplant viability, as little as four hours, slide, please. However, advances in technology over the last 20 years, specifically the use of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, that's the easy way to say it is ECMO, and associated portable devices can be exploited for both for live organ harvesting and for long distance transport, thus increasing a human organ's window of transplant viability to well over 20 hours. This is more than enough time to transport organs from Xinjiang, East Turkestan to a coastal Chinese hospital where foreign organ tourists like to go. Uh, slide, please. And here at the ECMO conference in uh, 2007 or 2008, 2008, I believe, is uh, our man, Dr., our friend, Dr. Chen. He's the second from the, from the right. Uh, and this is, uh, was subtitled the Medtronic ECMO Conference. Medtronic is an American company which makes ECMO products and machines. Uh, slide, please. 
The sales of foreign ECMO machines to Chinese transplant hospitals soared from 2016 to 2019. I'm not going to show you those figures because they're sensitive right now, and we're still digging out new figures, but they are there, okay? And they are going to some of the most notorious transplant hospitals in all of China, and some I've never even heard of before as well. Uh, slide, please. 7.7, the logistics of harvesting from Aksu to the East Coast. Slide, please. Thanks to uh, a gentleman in Norway, uh, a Uyghur gentleman in Norway, and to Google Cherahoja, all these elements, the hospitals, the camps, a crematorium, come together in a single square kilometer in a northwest corner of Xinjiang, East Turkestan, in Aksu Prefecture. Slide, please. Okay, I'm going to talk, I want you to look at the screen while I go through this one. These are two camps you're looking at on the, on the lower end of the screen. To the west, or to the left, a camp containing 16,000 people. Uh, you can see it's still kind of being constructed. To the east, uh, 500 meters approximately, a camp containing 33,000 people. Actually, it's a little more than 500 meters. Uh, in the north, Within the eastern camp's perimeters, there you've got that uh, blue circle. Uh, Aksu infection, I'm sorry, that's the, we've got in Aksu infection hospital, I'm sorry, as part of the 33,000 camp. And the blue circle, the northern point of the triangle, 900 meters from both camps, is a huge, there's a huge crematorium. Okay, slide please. Okay, slide please. That's the crematorium. This is, uh, it's rather outsized. It's, it's, we don't have an exact measurements for it. And it does not have smokestacks, which is kind of interesting uh, uh, or anything like that. But what we do see are these two, what appear to be pipes, though they could be walls. Uh, these two pipes, uh, one leading uh, both, both ways and uh, uh, these, it's very possible it's a water-based system. In other words, you pump water in, you mix the smoke with the water, a kind of effluent comes out of that, and that's pumped back into the river. The river's not far away. Uh, that at least is somebody from intelligence has analyzed the, this image and, and believe that that could be a, a possible, possible way that it's working. Slide, please. We mentioned that hospital. We can see right here, um, this is the, the hospital was first, so that's the red outline, and it's the Aksu Infection Hospital. The camp was actually built right around it. Slide, please. Now, from Aksu Infection Hospital, it's a 20-minute drive to the airport. Okay, 25 minutes, whatever. And there's a green channel established by Southern China Airlines. Uh, uh, slide, please. Uh, here's the drive. Okay, and slide, please. Uh, here's the airport. We don't have a picture of the green lane, but we do have China Southern Airlines does brag on its website uh, about the fact that they've done pulled a lot of transplants uh, out of here, okay, or that they 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 transplanted uh, organs or, or whatever. But it's all been done through this airport, and they're they're proud of that. Uh, the uh, next slide, please. Now there could be several end users uh, hospitals which are using the, these organs. Uh, but we think we found one uh, in Hangzhou, not far from Shanghai, the first hospital of Jiajing province has a formal big brother relationship with Aksu's doctors and medical apparatus. Slide, please. Uh, now here's the first hospital of Jiajing province. Slide, please. And First Hospital is one of China's 10 certified ECMO training centers. Now, beginning in 2017, liver transplants increased by 90%, while kidney transplants increased by over 200%. These are significant numbers. Slide, please. Uh, this is one of their surgery teams. Slide, please. Now, bringing it right up to a little closer to today, on March 1st, 2020, First Hospital successfully performed the first double lung transplant on a COVID-19 patient. 
Now, this really served as an advertisement because it came out in the uh, in the English language uh, Chinese media as well. And they clearly wanted everybody to see this. And uh, it really served as an advertisement for foreign organ tourists that even during the COVID-19 health crisis, First Hospital was open for business. Slide, please. Uh, and here they are celebrating after that first successful double lung trip, uh, right in the middle of the pandemic. Slide, please. Let's turn to point eight, witnesses to genocide. Uh, slide, please. Now, when Sarya Gul was teaching Chinese in her camp, she was a Chinese teacher. Uh, she had access to a makeshift faculty lounge. And following a camp-wide health check, they held them every two to three uh, months, a list with the health results would come back a couple of days later. Next to, th they put that list up on the wall and next to the list, uh, they were next to three of the names she remembers on, on one section that she was interested in, which her students came from, was a pink check mark. And those people would disappear in the middle of the night over the next 10 days. And I asked her why that happened and she organ harvesting, she said. Uh, slide, please. This is her, uh, Sarya Gold, with her, at her kitchen table with her husband. Uh, in southern Sweden. Slide, please. Now, Kazakhstan has the largest amount of camp survivors in the world. If the CCP's main goal is to suppress and destroy the Uyghurs, the Kazakhs can be seen uh, almost as accidental witnesses. And in general, most Kazakhs who are in the camps simply want to put the experience behind them. Yet this also means that if they agree to the interview, they are reliably objective and observant witnesses. And I'm now going to go into this is what they saw. Slide, please. Uh, and I just wanted to make the point that I did these interviews in Kazakhstan. That's uh, in the office of Atajur, which is a Kazakh human rights organization. It's, it's a very into this issue of the refugees coming out of the camps. That's uh, Sarek Jan on the right, who's uh, their uh, once and future leader. Uh, and uh, they were very helpful to me uh, in uh, getting witnesses to me. Slide, please. Now, there are two kinds of people who leave the camp. Uh, go ahead and put this slide. I'll talk over the slide, please. Uh, uh, the first people that leave the camp are young people, about 18 years old on average. And the announcement that they're graduating is usually made during lunch. It's a kind of celebratory thing. They're going to be exploited for their labor at a factory out east, possibly until they're no longer of childbearing age. Uh, slide, please. And I'm going to talk over this one too. Slide, please. Slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the second group is aged between 25 to 35. In fact, the average age is often 28, the stage of physical development that the Chinese medical establishment prefers for organ harvesting. These people are taken in the middle of the night. The average estimate of how many people were taken varied from person to person because they were all in different camps. But the average estimate tended to split between 2.5% to 5% annual disappearances for this age group. Slide, please. Some say there are 1 million in the camps. Some say there are 3 million. My best estimate for minimum disappearances, 1 million in the camps, 2.5% annual disappearances. In other words, at a minimum, 25,000 human beings disappear from the camps annually. Slide, please. That's 68 people per day. Slide, please. And every one of the people who disappeared, if their organs are extracted correctly and sold to foreign organ tourists, is worth between 500,000 to 750,000 US dollars. Slide, please. This is from back in 2005, but it gives you a sense of the prices. They've only gone up since then. Uh, slide, please. Now, nine final points. Uh, these findings simply can't be explained by other theories. Slide, please. Beijing's claim that the transplant system reformed in 2015 cannot explain the fact uh, that they were caught making up the numbers of voluntary donations. Using an equation, the proven persistence of short waiting times for organs 
a perceptible increase in hospital transplant capacity across China, and continued Chinese hospital promotions aimed at foreigners, particularly from the Gulf states. Slide, please. Now, if you're curious particularly about the voluntary donation numbers, I do recommend this book very highly, this report very highly. It's written by Matt Robertson for Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. And it's very current, and uh, I think he makes an absolutely airtight case that the voluntary donation numbers are made up. Uh, that doesn't mean we know what the voluntary donations numbers are. There could be lots of voluntary donations. We don't think there are based on our experiences, and both me and Matt have done this kind of research where we've had people calling to try to volunteer their organs, and the phone rings and rings, and nobody answers. Uh, but I th think we can pretty much uh, push that theory out. If you have a success, let's put it this way, if you have a successful voluntary donation program, you get the real numbers. Why wouldn't you? I mean, what's, what's the harm? Uh, there's nothing to defend there. Uh, you'd, you'd take pride in it. Uh, but in this case, what we know is you just have a simple equation that's supposed to show a kind of gentle exponential, exponential growth, and that's being used. Uh, and so the Chinese are, are lying about the numbers. That's a very bad sign. Uh, next slide, please. The overall picture of transplant activity is one of continuity, a gradual handoff from Falun Gong victims to Uyghur victims. And it is true that 28-year-old Falun Gong uh, practitioners are thin on the ground in China now, I, I think. But it is still worth noting that Falun Gong are still being harvested. And some Falun Gong have even been incarcerated in the Uyghur and Kazakh camps, according to Kazakh witnesses. Slide, please. Such as, if memory serves, and I'll have to go back and listen to that interview one more time, but such as this gentleman who, who told me that I believe that he saw uh, def definitively that there were Falun Gong in his camp. Uh, slide, please. Uh, now, surveillance. Yeah, I cannot explain both the intrusive health checks given to the Uyghur population and the repetitive health checks given inside the camp, the camps. Uh, DNA only needs a single sample. You never, it doesn't change. Tissue typing. And particularly the screening for diseases, blood diseases such as hepatitis, which can ruin organ harvesting, require repetitive testing. And that's a reasonable thing to do with people in prison. Uh, uh, slide, please. Beijing's counterterrorism initiative cannot explain the scale of the crematoriums, the green lanes for human organs in the airports, the brisk purchase of ECMO machines, or the mass disappearances of camp detainees in their late 20s. Slide, please. Beijing's anti-radicalization measures and vocational training cannot explain the persistence of the camps. Now, the CCP publicly claimed that 100% of the Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and Hui had graduated by the end of 2019, as any recent camp refugee or anyone studying camp activity on Google can confirm. The camps did not empty out in 2020. They are not ghost towns. Uh, Slide, please. Why? Because there are two financial pillars supporting the repression throughout Xinjiang and East Turkestan. They are forced labor and they are forced organ harvesting. Both have become self-perpetuating independent systems. They're state-sponsored, but independent. Without the West's active resistance, both are likely to continue for years to come. Uh, and that's the end of the presentation. If you could put me on full of screen, please. Yeah, that's the end of the presentation. So <laughs> I'll go full screen. It, 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 I, I do have something more to say. I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, right. Ethan, do you still want the presentation up or? I, I No, I don't need it up. I just wouldn't want to say something yep. more. Uh, just some concluding oh. remarks that are not in the memo itself. Uh, look, in the coming year, you may face at least one audience, if you're, say, an activist or maybe just a researcher in this area, or even a reporter, face at least one audience that has never really heard about the issue of organ harvesting being discussed in the media. 
No, that's not true. There, there's actually a fair amount of discussion in the media, but it's not doesn't tend to be front page. It doesn't tend to be on TV a lot. Uh, and that audience will take it as a signal that you, they don't need to take organ harvesting seriously now. Now, of all the people on the earth, Uyghurs should know that initial media skepticism means nothing. Uh, the camps were just a theory until the PSB uh, was intercepted bragging about uh, incarcerating 40% of Hotan's males. The rape of women, Uyghur women and Kazakh women, and the destruction of Uyghur fertility was just a rumor until Adrian Zentz from Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation made the numerical comparisons over time, which exposed how dramatically uh, fertility had, had decreased, uh, the birth rate had decreased over time. Slave labor was just an anecdote until the electronic auction of Uyghur workers was actually intercepted. Uh, the export of wigs made of female Uyghur and Kazakh hair was nothing more than a suspicion until U.S. Customs seized 13 tons of wigs. Uh, the deterioration in the Uyghur situation over the last five years shows us that anything is possible. And I do want to say one more word about that. That's the, the, the even these crematoriums, a crematorium with 50 security guards is not made just for 63 people a day. And it wouldn't be handling 63 people a day. It would be handling a much, some multiple of that, maybe 15 or 20, because it's in the room chief. Uh, you know, you might need a fairly big crematorium for that, but not that big. And I think what's very disturbing about these crematoriums is that they, you know, if China goes into a war or there's some sort of uh, communication breakdown with the rest of the world or some sort of crisis, uh, I suspect that those crematoriums will start operating 24-7. This is a real distinct possibility. So we everything is on the table now. And it is foolish to constantly wait until we've got an absolutely clear picture. What I've described for you today is, I think, a, having said that, it is a very clear picture. The same thing that we have seen in the other areas, we are now seeing with Aksu and with the Kazakh witnesses. Now, what we don't know should drive our research, but what we do know tells us that the survival of the Uyghur people is no longer assured. Uh, and I will take questions now, and uh, thank you very much for this, you know, sticking with me through this long-winded presentation. Well, thank you, Ethan, for your comprehensive presentation. Um, so just to all our attendees, we're now going to move to the Q&A part of this event. Um, if you have any questions or comments for Ethan, please enter them into the Q&A that you'll see on your screen. Um, so we've already got a couple questions um, from Muntaha and Graham. Um, so what can we help? Or how can we help? And uh, what can we do? Yeah, there's not, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, the, the, the policy side, I leave to a lot of, there's some wonderful people out there, especially among the Uyghur community, uh, Roshan Abbas, and uh, comes to mind, and Dalkin Isa, and so forth, uh, and many other people. And, and many of these people are friends of mine, I, I like them. But I would say this, that the problem isn't completely different than the problem we've had under Falun Gong. No group likes to hear that. The Falun Gong don't like to have themselves compared to Uyghurs necessarily, and the Uyghurs don't necessarily like to have themselves compared to Falun Gong. But it doesn't matter because they're in the same boat. It's the same problem, okay? Uh, a combination of, of disbelief and so forth. The first thing, if you are not an activist on that kind of level, and you're not pushing the new, whatever new Uyghur Human Rights Act is going to be put through Congress, uh, the most important thing you can do is talk to your doctor, any doctor. I don't care if it's their, uh, you know, if it's your dentist. Just talk to them. Just say, have you heard about this issue? But just make that conversation and bring it up because this the medical world holds the Trump cards in this case. You know, we can go politically, we can make things happen. And we are seeing things happening, at least certainly in the forced labor area and the uh, beginning of a decoupling of uh, fashion industries from from uh, China based on the cotton, pick, the cotton coming out of Xinjiang and so forth. Uh, but really, this is a very funny one, because what we're really after is we want a decoupling of all our, you know, our entire relationship with the Chinese transplant industry. 
all their doctors. We, they, these people ought to be pariahs. They ought to be like the Soviet psychiatrists were uh, in the 60s through the 90s. Nobody had any contact with Soviet psychiatrists. They weren't allowed to publish in our journals. They weren't allowed to attend our universities in psychiatric care, uh, all because we knew about a couple of psychiatric hospitals where they were doing mean things to dissidents. Actually, we know much more about the, about the uh, transplant hospitals than we ever knew about this. The difference is money. There's a lot of money to be made in the transplant industry in China. And supplying that with bio glue and with, with new machines and, of course, with expensive drugs, uh, immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, we have to decouple from all of that. And that is going to require the cooperation of the medical community, or at least parts and elements of that medical community. Now, that can happen very quickly. That split can take place very fast. But this is the focus. This has to be the focus of our attention here. And I'm sorry if that's not a quick and easy answer. I'd say one other thing. Uh, ETAC uh, and transplant abuse, the International Coalition and Transplant Abuse in China is a kind of activist organization. I think it's a very rational one. <laughs> and I'm very proud to have been involved with its founding. But they are going to have many ways of participating. And if you go to that website and hit that email, you will very quickly find out ways that you can participate directly that incorporate your skills into some specific area. Uh, and even if it's only a few of you who are volunteering, this makes a huge difference. Uh, sometimes events like this just capture a few people in that, but it's enough. And those people usually stick with the issue for a long time. Okay, that's my experience. Thanks, Ethan. So we have another question here from Stu. So they say, thank you so much for your presentation. I wanted to ask about the One Belt, One Road initiative. Have there been any investigations into the ramifications of this project's progress in terms of forced Turkic labor in Xinjiang? Has organ harvesting industry, has the organ harvesting industry been affected by obor developments? By which developments? I'm sorry, by one which one road. That's the one belt, one road. So the Belt and Road Initiative. Oh well, I think it. Ha I think it has. I mean, it's it's initially, uh, Huang Jiefu, who was kind of the master of ceremonies of uh, of organ harvesting in China, and he's, he's he's had various positions. I don't even want to go into them all. They're so bureaucratic. But he he really is the spokesman for this this issue. And when the Belt and Road Initiative was announced, he said, "Oh, well, this is great. We can actually export organs." to countries who are cooperating with us on the Belt and Road Initiative. In other words, we can give them organs. Now, I thought initially when I heard that, that he was just, you know, doing what people in China do, is, you know, the new campaign comes along, rah, rah, <laughs> whatever it is, you know, if it's if you used cars, it's like, we well, you use used cars on the Belt and Road Initiative, whatever. In this case, no, I think he was, you know, I, I got that wrong. He was right, he, he really meant it. I mean, this is a man who went to Taiwan and said, basically, if you'll shut up about organ harvesting of Falun Gong, uh, we'll give you free organs. And I, I, I don't think he, I think he meant it, okay? And so I think with the Belt and Road Initiative, there is some idea here that Uyghur organs could be used, as, you know, uh, and they could be exported. The fact is, that is within the realm of possibility now. And the Belt and Road Initiative, now I've seen it up close, it's not as successful in Kazakhstan, at least in the roads as, as people think, and they really ought to get some snow plows out there. Uh, guys, but you know, leaving that aside, you know, it is a more, it is an efficient, temporarily more efficient methods of transportation. You've still got planes coming in and so forth, and there are there are rumors that some of the airports are being used to fly in organs. Now, I don't incorporate that as part of the nine points memo because I don't have actual proof on that. I just have rumors, and I don't tend to leave those things aside. But to say that the Belt and Road Initiative isn't part of this, absolutely it is, because the what China wants is complicity. This is a, a kind of a virus, a kind of sickness, uh, or an addiction. And how does an addict think? An addict wants other people to be addicts too, because it justifies their position, right? Which is why there's been so much emphasis on Chinese surgeons going down to Vietnam to train them in organ harvesting, which is why there's been, uh, you know, Definitely, uh, there have been some cases in North Korea of innocent people being harvested for their organs, and they've certainly learned that from China. Do they want to expand that along the entire Belt and Road Initiative? Do they want Turkic buy-in on the biggest, you know, on a genocidal crime against the Uyghur people? Yes, they do. This would be ideal.
Yep, um, thanks for your answer, Ethan. So we just have a question from um, an anonymous attendee. They say, has there been a lot, there has been a lot of talk of halal organs. What is it and is there evidence to support that this is happening? You know, thank you. It's a great question. I, I don't, uh, I didn't put that in the memo for a specific reason. We do have evidence that they, uh, Chinese are I very interested in the Arab market. Okay, that is the Arab foreign tourist market, okay, foreign organ tourist market. That is, they want people to come in from Saudi Arabia, from the Gulf states, who have a lot of money, and they want them to get their, get organs in China. There's no question about this. I mean, you can go back with Tianjin Central Hospital, that enormous hospital, the biggest one. And if you use the Wayback Machine six years ago, you had a choice between English and Arabic as your languages to, to, to continue on the website. Uh, we know that Tianjin Central has been photographed uh, by a Korean filmmaker who, you know, you can clearly see in the photographs and from the what you can hear, the Arabic's being spoken, and these are mainly Gulf state uh, foreign organ tours. Uh, it is also true that even the Washington Post, in an attempt to debunk this entire issue, ended up agreeing that there was definitely Gulf state people <laughs> getting their organs. This is all illegal, by the way, by Chinese law since 2007, ever since Kilgore and Matus came out with Bloody Harvest. Uh, that's been law that you, you can't go to China. But of course, that's not true. And we have a hospital that's advertising on the web, uh, a, a traditional Chinese medicine hospital, and it, they show a prayer room. They show the woman takes you and say, here's her prayer room where Muslims can pray. And then here is the room afterwards where you can sit and drink juice and talk with your friends and relax and have a rest. And, you know, I mean, this is very clearly and then they bring on somebody who's an Arabic uh, tourist. And it's, it's a clearly an Oregon tourist uh, hospital because they do kidneys. They're very expert on kidneys and uh, some extent livers. The, uh, so there's no questions out there. I want to see an ad. I want to see a discussion board. I want to see something in Arabic which talks about halal organs because that is a key piece of information. If you are going to China for halal organs, that means you need a Muslim. And if you need a Muslim in China, it's got to be either Uyghur, Razak, Kyrgyz, Uzbek, or Huay. You really, there's no other options. There are no other Muslims in China. And that tells you a lot, okay? So it's a very important piece of information. If there's anybody listening who comes from, who speaks Arabic and wants to do the tedious work of going through, and then they also have to learn how to use the Wayback Machine because it may not be on the web anymore. They may have to go back. Uh, this could be a breakthrough finding. And you, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you can give it to the, the Uyghur Tribunal in London. You can give it to Kulchara Hoja. You can give it to me. It doesn't matter. Give it to the BBC whatever just get that finding out there because it could save lives thanks ethan um so we have time for one more question um or maybe two yeah so uh, there's been kind of two questions from um a couple of attendees on the same issue so um the one from sheldon reads uh what about asking the international medical community and democratic nations suspending medical collaborations and educational contacts with china in transplantation medicine and surgery as well as in obstetrics gynecology and family planning giving given forced birth prevention that's a great question and i hadn't even thought much about the family planning point i'm sure uh that's gotten mixed up with american politics many times in the past uh, and, you know, uh, that's, that's been the main problem there. Okay. Is that it's perceived to be all, it goes into the abortion issue and then it, it gets mixed up with that. Uh, I, I would argue at least now, at least now for keeping this somewhat pure. Uh, the, uh, we start with the transplant hospitals and the transplant doctors, the transplant surgeons use the uh, Magnitsky Act and so forth on these doctors. Uh, prevent them from coming to the U.S., uh, basically destroy their Western reputations. I, I have no, I mean, there's no reason to protect these people. And, and uh, I couldn't agree more that that's the way to go. The problem here is we just saw it in the, in, in the middle of the COVID crisis in January. We saw the World Health Organization lying on behalf of Beijing to protect Beijing's feelings, as far as I can tell. I mean, it wasn't like they were protecting the health of the world, that's for sure. Uh, I, I really don't know how we get beyond that. It's very difficult 
to uh, reform when the leadership, the WMA, the WHO, the Transplantation Society, have all uh, made it clear that their first priority is keeping Beijing happy, and then that will lead to reform. Well, that's been tried and it's failed. It's been tried since 2012, uh, that kind of engagement, and it has colossally failed. It's failed both in to prevent a pandemic, and it certainly failed to protect the Uyghur people or the Falun Gong people in the main. And uh, we, you know, that's a, a tough call. How do you get rid of that leadership? And I can't say how to do that. And I'm not an expert on undermining the leadership or getting new candidates to run uh, or starting new groups, but it has to happen. And I do believe that Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting, as it's small as it is, is a beginning of an answer. And I certainly believe the International Coalition and Transplant Abuse in China is an answer. But the biggest answer there comes from the Uyghurs themselves the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs, because uh, it is, this is, people need in the medical world, it's, we can't be abstract about this. They need to see the human culture. This is the destruction of entire families, of culture. It will ripple through, even if the Uyghurs make it out the other end, even if the Communist Party were to fall tomorrow, this is a trauma that will last for generations to come, okay? It's, it's not going to be resolved so quickly. Uh, we're going to see it in every generation, some form of this coming out. Uh, it, this is a terrible, terrible mistake for not only for the Chinese people as well, who've been complicit with this in many cases and felt they had no choice, but that they have been complicit on some level. This is a terrible thing to do to a society. It is, it's not even based on anti-Islam so much as it's based on race. That's become fairly obvious. Uh, particularly with the rapes that have been going on and so forth, kind of unprecedented. Uh, this has made it possible. Uh, now I'm, I'm talking myself into a blue funk here, so let's pull out of that. What's the next question, please? I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, we have time for one more question. So Caroline asks, have you contacted the U.S. ECMO producers? If so, what was their response to their products being used in China for organ harvesting? Well, to be quite candid, my, my literary agent contacted them. She sort of got involved, and she's very good at that kind of thing. She used to be a public affairs uh, specialist for several major companies. And uh, they did what a good public affairs specialist does and goes, what? Really? <laughs> really? In China? Really? Oh, my goodness. No, we're, we're you know, squeaky clean company. Well, they aren't a squeaky clean company. They've been pulled before Congress a couple of times on some issues. But that's not, uh, as far as we know, the current ECMO machines, which are probably the more portable ones, because uh, Medtronic wasn't so good at those, uh, we think are probably coming from Germany. So uh, this is, you know, we're back to the Germans again. And this is another thing, by the way, that I hear when people ask, and sometimes in these forums, they say, well, can't we have Europe kind of lead something? And of course, that's impossible without Germany taking the lead. And uh, they've been, uh, Germany has just been appalling on this issue. I mean, look at the head of Volkswagen. He's still got a plant making Volkswagen stuff in, in, in Shijak. I mean, who, who would do that at this time? Uh, so, so again, we're, we're in kind of a, a difficult position there with the company, but they, rest assured, these will, this stuff will come out. Uh, and these companies will be uh, properly embarrassed. They, of course, they have to know about how their products are being used. Uh, now, ECMO, their defense is fairly simple, though. They're going to say, oh, well, you know, once COVID started, COVID-19, ECMO really saved lives. And it's true because it oxidates lungs. If I were to get a, a COVID-19, uh, most likely, hopefully, they'd put me on some sort of ECMO device and, and, and keep me oxygenated, even especially if they had to move them from this country hospital near where I live to someplace big like uh, uh, Albany. And that's true. But the problem here is that the ECMO machine sales that went crazy started in 2017 and went to 2018 in the very beginning of 2019, and then they stopped. Now, we know that ventilator sales went crazy in 2019, June, and that's probably because the Chinese already knew about COVID-19 back in June. They didn't call it that, but they already knew they had to have a lot of, they were getting a lot of patients with lung problems. Uh, so they started buying uh, ventilators instead. They didn't buy ECMO. They used existing ECMO probably for 
uh, trying to save lives in China during the COVID-19 crisis. But I think that's significant, and it does tell you uh, that this machine has been a central part of the, uh, it's made it possible. You see, you couldn't have used Xinjiang before. It's too far away. It's more than four hours away from uh, the, the coast, you know. You'd just be rushing. You'd be running out of the airport on both ends. Uh, that's that's not gonna that's not gonna happen. Uh, now we've got like 20 hours, and uh, and there are other people who are to blame for that, including the uh, who's sometimes called the father of ECMO in China, which is a, a Mayor Ko of Taiwan, Ko and Jia. Uh, it was also involved in teaching that. I don't know if he really understood the full ramifications of what he was doing, uh, but there it is. Historically, there's a lot to answer for. Thanks for that answer, Ethan. Um, so there's been a lot of questions, everyone. So thanks for sending all those through. Um, for those that didn't get their questions answered, just a reminder, we will be sending out answers via email um, after uh, the, uh, the webinar, if that suits anyone. Um, so thanks so much, Ethan, for um, your insightful presentation and thank you everyone for attending today. Um, so just in order to develop the webinar series, so it caters to the needs of participants, we've popped a brief survey that we hope you will complete as soon as you leave the webinar. So as soon as you leave the event, you'll see a link appear on your screen that you can click on. Um, it'll just be a pop-up in the middle of your screen. Um, and we will also be sending out a document that details the points that Ethan has made in his presentation. So just further insights, um, if you didn't get to uh, have your answers um, provided today. So we'll be in touch soon regarding the next ETAC webinar to be held in January. Uh, but thank you everyone for coming today and thank you Ethan again for your um, insightful presentation.